All right, so I'll bring you back, everyone. Perfect. Welcome to Ask the Experts, Tri City Regional Chamber of Commerce's series to help business leaders grow their companies with practical advice and answers that you can implement right away. And a special welcome to those watching remotely on Zoom as well, as you're a valuable part of our audience today. And hello to those watching the recording on YouTube. My name is Paul Casey. I'm the Executive Director of Leadership Tri Cities and privileged to be your facilitator today. And I took speech class twice. It's a sophomore in high school, and then they switched the credits and they moved it to a junior year class. I had to take it again, and I was scared to death. And uh, now I'm a speaker, so don't let this happen to you. Okay. Uh, this is a free benefit of your chamber membership. It couldn't be possible without the generous sponsorship of STCU. With us is Kevin today. Come on up here. Welcome, Welcome the crowd. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being able to attend this with us today in person. And for those that are in the virtual world, hello. My name is Kevin Moran, part of the community relations team with STCU. And one of the things that we're always excited about and looking forward to each month is Ask the Experts. This topic is very exciting. For the ones that are here, I hope you're able to gain some understanding and how we can really attract our audience as we're speaking on certain topics. It's one of the reasons why I love this job. It's always been so much fun speaking at different audiences, whether it's our members or folks just out in the community. We love it. And we just love that we have amazing speakers today with Isaac and Jan. So looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. We are grateful to your support of Ask the Experts. For approximately half of our, four, our 90 minutes together, our experts will be presenting their gold nuggets on our topic of hooking them and giving better presentations. And for the second half, they will answer your questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, and we encourage everyone in the room to think of one question to ask, and even in the virtual world, if you would all think of a question that you can post, you can text me uh, this number if you want to write it down or put it in your phone. <clears throat> 509-392-1895, or you can just raise your hand if you're in the room, or if you are on Zoom, you can just type your question into the chat, and I will curate those to, for our guests today. Um, their contact information is all, will be also be on the slide at the end, and they will stick around afterward if you'd like to get to know them a little bit better. So let me introduce our speakers today. Isaac Butts is a dynamic and passionate speaker. Over the past 10 years, Isaac has earned recognition as a trusted advisor by playing a critical role in developing influential leaders as well as future leaders across the USA. He has been hired by various organizations to provide strategic guidance, training, and motivation. Isaac functioned as the first African-American vice president of marketing for a national healthcare group, showing his determination and desire to be an asset to every organization he works with. His cross-functional experience has prepared him with the skills to elevate your performance and self-belief. Isaac and his wife, Jessica, also run a nonprofit who has poured over $50,000 into the futures of students here in the Tri-Cities, empowering their lives by sending them to leadership growth opportunities around the country. Isaac is also the author of the children's book, I Can and I Will, and the creator of the goal-setting curriculum, The GPS. Jan McDonald. She cares about people and their future growth and success. For 14 years, Jan was the CEO of a very successful faith-based pregnancy medical clinics. Jan became a Maxwell Leadership Certified Coach, a speaker and trainer in 2015 because of the great impact leadership skills has had on her organization, her life, and relationships. For those 14 years, she coached and raised up leaders so she could leave a legacy that would flourish after she left the CEO position to pursue her own business in coaching, speaking, and training in 2018. That experience as CEO makes her an excellent match for the leadership, vision, and strategic planning required for the companies and individuals she serves. Jan is a results-oriented yet compassionate leader. And there's so much more to be said about both of them, but let's welcome our experts today. Thank you, Dr. Let's get it, man. How's everybody doing? Hey. Awesome, man. Um, I don't know. Has, it, has, has anybody here heard me present before? Have I ever present? No, never. This is the first time. Yes, first time. I just want to you know, feel like it. Okay, okay, awesome. I'm a little crazy when I present, so I'm just gonna <laughs> let you know that I just kind of do what I do. Um, but I believe um, in results in what I do. 
and I believe in everything that I say. I'm excited about today because I believe that presenting is the gateway to get access to your promotions in your lives. Like, listen, I just, I know without a shadow of a doubt, the way that you present yourself when you walk into the room, my mother always told me, if you want to get pr promoted, you got to sit in the front of the room. None of you guys have the same mom. <laughs> um, but the, the presentation is everything. The way that you carry yourself, the way that you speak, your mannerisms, the information that you have inside of your mind, and the way that you give that information to your audience is crucial in your promotion and your growth, not only personally, but within your organization, and even your personal if you have a business that is and even in your personal growth in the organization that you may work for if you understand how to present you can hook everybody i know this i've done this um in every corporate sector that i've worked at um i was able to do this in a startup health company that i worked for um i started about eight years ago i'm no longer with them we sold before they sold actually we transitioned out um, but I was able to present myself in a way that helped us grow, not only help me grow and rise inside of that organization, but help me present in boardrooms just like this to people that were way smarter than me, but believed everything that I said. I did. I was actually speaking fast, by the way, but believed <laughs> everything that I said and helped us secure multi-million dollar deals. And so I believe that there is a way to present to hook them. And today, I believe that what we are going to give, both me and Jan today, we're going to give you guys some tools that are going to put you in a position that when you present, whether it's to your boss, whether it's to future clients, well, I don't care who it is, whether you're presenting to your wife. Sometimes I got to, listen, babe, let me, let me set it up. It's got time to set me up. You know, like, listen, I don't care who you're presenting to. If you will follow what it is that we are, we are going to teach you today, it'll put you in the best position to be successful. At the end of the day, this is all about forging connections with the audience that you are presenting to. And so today we have a very simple acronym um, that is called Just Speak. Say Just Speak. Just yeah, Speak. All right, put it in the chat if you want to chat. We got people in the chat room. Is there people yep. in there? Hello. All right, man. Write Just Speak inside. How many people have presented before? Who, who in here has given a presentation before? And who in here, when you give the presentation, sometimes you're like, you're nervous. Like you, you're thinking, you know, is, I was thinking this, is my fly zipped up? I don't want to. Talk. <laughs> like maybe you're thinking, you know, I mean, I, I hope I don't stumble over my words. Maybe you're thinking, I hope I remember all the slides. And you're just not confident all the way. You got the butterflies. And, you know, when you leave after the presentation, you're like, no, I could have done a, a thousand times better if I wasn't so nervous. Has anybody ever been there before? Yeah, you've been there? Okay, good. Y'all keeping it real today. I love it. Just a little bit nervous. Well, I believe that what we are going to present to you today, me and Jan, it's going to put you from a position of being nervous to a position that all you have to do is just speak. And, and when you're in a position where you just speak, everything is very simple. Today, I'm going to be giving the, the mindset behind presenting, how to prepare yourself. And Jan is going to walk you through a framework that's going to take your presentation to the next level. I'm really excited to hear what she's going to bring to the table. But today, I'm going to talk about the just part, because I think sometimes in our minds, we get so encapsulated in what we are doing that we don't just be. And so today we're going to look at what that looks like to just be. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And the first aspect of this is the jump. If you're taking notes, it's the jump and the jump. Look, I used to run track. I think I still got the record at Richland High. I don't know. I don't check it. I may or may not go to the little award ceremony to see if anybody broke it, you know, every year. But when I ran track, what was more important than the finish a lot of times was the start. The start, the jump, like from the beginning, like the jump. It was real like when, when it goes off, you want to see her coming out, head down, dry face, <laughs> over the hurdle, nice and smooth. You know that they off to a good start. They are ready to win the race. The jump is the most important aspect of your entire presentation. If you don't have a good 
jump, you're going to put yourself behind the eight ball to connect and forge connections with the audience that you are trying to connect with. The jump is beyond important. Say the jump. The jump. All right, type it in the chat. The jump. It is very, very important. In fact, it's so important that some of the largest organizations in the world utilize the skill set. So uh, me and my wife earlier this year, this was a good, we traveled a lot this year. Earlier this year, we went down to Florida. We went to Florida and we went to Disney World. I went to Disney World and she loved Disney World. She was excited. She looked like a little child. You know, she was here. Oh, I didn't. Well, we went out. It was business, though. It was a leadership conference. And so we left the kids at home. I told my wife, listen, just tell them we're going on business. They believed it. Then they saw the pictures out. It was questioning us. It is what it is. So we left and we went down to Disneyland, Disney World, actually, one of the greatest organizations, biggest organizations in this country. And when we went down there, there was something that my wife, wanted to make sure I did not do again. And that was getting her to jump on a ride she did not want to go to. See, when we went to Disneyland a couple years ago, I spoke at Disneyland at a youth conference. And when we went over to, to Universal, they had some rides that I like to go to. And so we went to the ride and there was a ride that was called the Tower, the, T the Tower of Terror was the name of the ride, but they renamed it to the Guardian of Galaxy. <laughs> My wife will get on this ride. So we go <laughs> to get on the ride. And when we step into the ride, when you step in, what was amazing to me was when you walk through the doors, you step into a whole new world. I was like, yo, I'm in the movie. And you forgot about that 45 minute wait because you were encapsulated in the opening that they were giving. And as we walk through the ride and you get in there and you get to this place where they close the door behind you and then all of a sudden Rocket came out. And I was like, ah. and like you was in the movie. And I was like, yeah, that's my man right there. And we walking through and my wife, she was just engulfed in and she was looking and I'm thinking to myself, got her, you know, <laughs> and she, and she, you can't go nowhere now, you know, and she's just, she's locked in. And, and as we go into the, to the ride, it was almost like we were in the middle of a scene. It was so beautiful. And then we hopped on the ride, and the ride continued the scene that we were opened with. Disneyland does this better than anybody. If you want people to hop on the ride, you have to make sure that your opening is legit. You know Disneyland is putting a lot of money into the opening. They're making sure that you are comfortable with it, even if you was a little bit scared. Even if, I don't know if this presentation is for me. I don't know if this is going to help me. No, if the opening is amazing, you'll start to find value in what is being presented. The open is beyond important because the opening helps create a mindset. Now, this is what my question is for you. When you present, what is your mindset when you go in? Do you go in with a mindset of, man, I'm about to kill this presentation, and we finna walk out, baby, they about to sign the checks. My wife likes when I come home with the contracts. Like, they, so we ain't going to sign the checks, and look, at this is going to work out. Like, I'm telling you right now, our life is going to change. I guarantee you, when you walk in, do you have a mindset that you are going to absolutely crush the presentation and that you are not only going to change your life, but that they will buy into what it is that you're presenting, their lives will be changed. What is the mindset behind it? Do you have a winning mindset? I can only imagine the Imagineers, when they're presenting and creating this opening, they know without a shadow of a doubt, when you experience this thing, your mind is going to shift because they had a mind shift that that is exactly what was going to take place. What is your mindset? I don't know what you got to do. Maybe you got to kumbaya on the car before you come in. I don't know what you do, man. Me, I, I just pray, Lord, help me make this thing great so that I can get another piece of cake. Amen. <laughs> I, walk in, I walk in and everything is absolutely right on point. I don't know what you got to do, but what are you doing to make sure that your mindset is right for an opening that will absolutely crush. Are you hearing me? The open, the jump is the most important aspect of what you do inside of your presentation. You hearing me? You tracking with me? 
You picking up what I'm putting down? Awesome. The second aspect of this is what I call unity and satisfaction, or it's the us factor. Say us. All right, man, write us in the chat. I don't know if you can see me. Maybe you can write us in the chat. There has to be unity and satisfaction. What does that mean? That means that what satisfies me will satisfy you. There's nothing worse than when you see a presentation of any type and you sitting back and you like, what in the world is in this for me? Like, that's great. I'm glad you're excited about it, but I don't see the value that you see. Have you ever been in a presentation that you just like, I came here, I thought I was going to get this, but I'm not getting the value that I thought I was going to get when I signed up to come here, and there wasn't a unity and satisfaction. And I know that you paid them to come in and speak, but for whatever reason, for me, I'm not getting what I thought I was going to get out of this thing. There has to be what I call the us factor or unity and satisfaction. So as I was doing research for this, I saw this right here, these beauties. I'm about to get another pair. I told my wife I'm about to get some again. The Reebok pumps. The Reebok pumps. And they came out in 1989, the year I was born. 1989. I know I dated myself a little bit. Man. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. If you was, anybody beautiful. I don't have to. All right, listen. Anyway. So they came out in, in 1989, but does anybody know what came out in this market in 1985? Jordans. Yeah, them Jordans. Them Jordans came out in 1985, and what happened in that moment is Nike took all the market share. Everybody wanted Jordans. Everybody wanted Jordans to the point that there was a lot of different shoe organizations that dried up because everybody wanted to be like Mike. Everybody did. Everybody. They, they, wanted, they wanted the Jays on it. No matter how much it costs, I don't care what it is, we're going to mortgage the house. We're going to get the jets. But Reebok came up with this idea, came up with this idea to come up with the Reebok pumps. And what I love about this idea was they did a couple of things to make sure that there was the us factor, unity and satisfaction. They researched the market and they said, all right, what does the market really Need. And when you look at the commercial with Dominique Williams, you know, and he's putting these things on and he walks into the court. It's really dim. They didn't have good lighting back then. And he walks in and he, he begins to pump the shoes. And you hear this plane. They understood that the market wants to fly like Mike. How can we put them in a position where we can steal back some of this market share? They did the research to put them in a position to steal what was theirs from the beginning. Or should they take back? I think they took back market share. What was cool is from 1989 to 1992, they not only took back some of the market share from the company into a $22 billion organization, why? Because they did research. If you're taking notes, in order to create the us factor, you got to do number one, you got to do research. Number one, research is important. Why? Because when you do research, the reason why you're doing that to create a presentation that will draw and engage people, that will connect to them, is because number two, what you're trying to do is you're trying to draw them to you. So research equals the draw, okay? So number one, you want to research. Why? So that you can draw them in. But when you draw them in, you want to draw them in with what I call the us factor. There has to be a unity and satisfaction. When kids were watching that commercial, they were saying, man, I want to fly too. I don't got to buy J's. I can get these. Amazing. That works. Perfect. Not only did the organization want market share, but the customer wanted to join in on that ride. Right? Your research is what is going to put you in a position to draw. I'll give you an example. Um, I have a speaking company. I, I obviously I do consulting inside of school districts, and I also do for companies and organizations. I'll give you an example from um, uh, let's do let's do our school, let's do schools. So because we're just revamping our program right now for it. So what I did was 
We took our product and what we have, and we did research on what the market needs right now. I had my product, but I'm adapting my product to what's important. Mental health is very important right now inside of these schools. So what did I do? I just researched some articles. I got some legitimate articles. I read through those articles, researched the, the information behind mental health and how it connects to the future of students. I tied that into my presentation not only that, there's a program called PBIS inside of these schools, and I wanted to understand how PBIS works inside of the school. So I went and I sat into the boardroom of some of these PBIS planning committees to understand what exactly they're looking for and how this works. When I sat in there, I took that research, and now when I present, you ain't got no choice. I hope them because I'm trying to draw them in. Listen, you got to take some time to research and see what they want to create that us factor, the unity and satisfaction. If there's no unity and satisfaction, it's never going to work. You understand? You're picking up what I'm putting down. There has to be that because that is what's going to create the draw. The last part of just is this. It's real simple, man. It's the tempo. Say tempo. 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 Say tempo. tempo. And then type tempo in the chat. Tempo. You know that... <laughs> Y'all got tempo, man? Y'all can dance? Nah? Y'all don't know how to dance? Work? Okay, that's fine. You, don't dance and don't hurt yourself. <laughs> tempo is important when it comes to a presentation. It's beyond important. It's the cadence that gets people moving. Nobody wants a glitchy tempo. Nobody. I don't care who we are. Nobody wants it. Listen, I went to a wedding. Man, Lord help me. We went to a wedding a couple months back. And we got to the wedding, and they played this song. Me and my wife are high school sweethearts. And, uh, man, we, we looked at each other the second the intro began, the tempo started. You know, you, you've been there before. We looked at each other, and we was like, oh, my gosh, that's our jam. We got up, and we go to the dance floor, and we began grooving. It felt like our senior prom out there. <laughs> we singing every single word. We jamming out. Everybody is connected. The tempo is flowing. Everyone is locked in, stepping together, moving together, grooving together. I mean, it's a beautiful moment. We get halfway through the second verse, me and my wife, we rap in every single verse, every word, line to line, and the DJ switched the song. <laughs> and he looked like he ain't know he messed up, you know? Sometimes you mess up and don't nobody know. Everybody knew he messed up, you know what I'm saying? He still was like, yeah, I'm like, no, you just, you ruined the whole tempo. Me and my wife, we left the dance floor after that. Like, man, you don't know what you're doing, man. We, everybody left. They were like, this guy, he don't know what he's doing. Nobody wants a glitchy tempo. If you want your audience to continue to engage in the dance that you're presenting, you got to make sure that you don't have a glitchy tempo. You got to get rid of the ums. And the um. <laughs> Come on, stop switching. Stop switching the song. I like the way this thing was moving, but it got glitchy. You got to make sure that you understand how to build the story inside of your presentation. So look, one process should lead to the next process, should lead to the next process in such a smooth path that they feel like they at the movie theaters and they didn't know that they got information that's going to change their own entire lives. So smooth. Tempo is important. If you are going to put yourself in a position to present in a way that's going to engage your audience, you got to, number one, the jump's got to be legit. The opening is so important. If you don't got a good opening, sit down. <laughs> Go sit down somewhere. The opening is beyond important. Then you got to create unity and satisfaction. Beyond important. Uh, there's got to be something in it for me. It's got to be something in it for you, man. You just got an Amazon box. I just got one. <laughs> I know. It's just a I feel like mine goes off every two minutes. Like, babe, how much stuff did we buy? Like, come on. <laughs> so you got to have unity and satisfaction. Unity and satisfaction. And then you got to make sure that you have a good tempo. Listen, your tempo is going to be different. What I love about the speaking world is I got people that present like me. I'm just crazy. All right. This is who I am. 
how God made me. I've always been this way. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. This is just how I work. There's other people that present in a different manner, more straightforward. Their temple's a little bit more slow. Whether they deliver is a little bit more easy. But their tempo is their tempo, right? You got to give people a tempo that will keep them engaged. That's the beauty of this. This is an art. You got to understand the art of it. If you don't understand the art of it, you're never going to present a presentation that will engage the people. You know what I'm saying? So you got to have the jump. You got to create unity and satisfaction. How do you do that? Through research. Your research will create the draw. And then when you have those things together, now you got to create a tempo that will keep them on the ride. This is how you put yourself in a position. You don't have to think. And you just speak. Say just speak. Yeah, just speak. Awesome, man. Type just speak in the chat. And I'm going to pass it off to one of the greatest speakers in this region who was trained by one of the greatest leaders in the world. My girl, Jan. There you go, Jan. Give it up, Jan. He is such a hard act to follow. Whoa, whoa. So I lead an organization on Fridays called Link Up to Us. And one of my very favorite things is to ask who is new here. And the people who raise their hands and say, I'm new here, I always say, oh, this is so awesome. Now you get to give the five minute presentation. <laughs> and their eyes get this big. And then I say, just kidding. And then it's okay. So let me ask you a question and you can put this in the chat if you are online as well. What is the first thing that comes to your mind or the first feeling that you get? when you are asked to give a presentation. And this is interactive, so you can answer if you want to. Sweaty pits. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> excitement. Yeah, excitement. Okay, good, good, good. There are some people like um, Isaac and I and you out there who give me a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> but most people, in fact, 75% of people, if you are afraid, if you are nervous, you are like 75% normal because 75% of the people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. That is so true. And so most of what I'm going to share with you today is going to help you overcome that in the casket type thing. And most of what I've gotten is from either watching my mentor, John Maxwell, or the information that I've gotten from Roddy Gal Galbraith, who is my speaking trainer. And you know what else I'm thrilled to be here for besides the fact that you're, I'm thrilled because of the Q and A. Because when you ask questions, oh, I get to learn too, because you are so smart. And the fact that you're here wanting to improve your speaking style, that makes me just thrilled as well. So as a speaker, I just wanted to let you know, um, I've had some mishaps and none of them killed me although they felt like it at the time. <laughs> I had a presentation to some business owners online and um, it was Teams or some other kind of online thing and I'd never done it before. Had this great presentation all prepared and it crashed. <laughs> and then the Teams or whatever it was would not let me in again to give my presentation. Mm -hmm. So no present, you been there? Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> yes, yes. Or the team that people paid really good money to hear a Zoom presentation that I, a class that I was facilitating, and my Zoom crashed, and no presentation. Or this is my favorite one. Why not? I gave a three-hour workshop, and my laptop was over across the room, a million miles away. I had no idea what was coming up next. None. It was a good thing I printed out my notes. But then that doesn't always work either because one time I printed out the wrong notes and had to wait. And the times that I always tried to be another speaker, those were the absolute worst. So the, I could go on, but the best thing that happened to me after this was um, I was taking a class from the online university, the Maxwell Online University, and they have their own production staff. They have people who film the people, they have teleprompters, everything, and the whole thing crashed. 
And I just sat there at my desktop and smiled because it happens to the big guys as well. So one of the concepts also, besides it's okay when stuff like that happens, is that not to focus so much on the content. Yeah, we have to have really good content to add value to people. But content is so oh, is so much more easier than what is really important, and that's connecting with your audience. So people who give information are, are just giving information, but people who communicate with their audience connect. And this really adds value to people. So I formed this presentation just like Isaac in an acronym, SPEAK. And he's already told me about that. Did I miss a slide? No. Oh, good. Okay. So the first one, the S is selfless. So write down, if you are in the chat, selfless, or take this as notes, because as a speaker, we are not the main attraction. Oh, yeah, it feels like it. But we're not the main attraction. Uh, attraction. The entire population of the world, John Maxwell says this all the time, with one minor exception, is composed of others. And the minute that you get over yourself and start considering the people that you are talking to is when you begin to connect. So my real first speaking engagement came as a volunteer. I um, volunteered to teach healthy relationship education to middle schoolers and high schoolers. Not that I knew what a healthy relationship was, but when I was growing up, but I wanted them not to grow up like I did. I didn't want them to grow up with drugs and alcohol as a background abuse. And also um, back then when we were teaching, it was all about abstinence, which now is called sextinence, sexual integrity. So um, we would teach them how to goal set and teach them what was going to be very successful in their life. And I had a blast doing this. But part of the conversation and part of it was about sex. And I didn't have a problem talking about, well, after a while, you know, because that can, that can be a real embarrassing subject to talk about sex. Um, but I realized that if someone had given me that information when I was their age, maybe my life would have turned out just a little bit different. And so that became my passion was to help these kids not have my life of drugs, alcohol, and tons of boyfriends. And so I had to focus on that to get over my embarrassment. <laughs> Most of the time, I was not embarrassed anymore, except for when I'd go to the grocery store and they would introduce me as the sex lady. <laughs> I had a lot of explaining to do to the moms and the dads. Hey, that's the sex lady, mom. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but it was not about me. It was all about them. And you know what else is so good that it's not about me or you? Is you don't know my presentation. So I can make a mistake. I can misspeak. You don't know what I'm going to leave out. That totally set me free. Totally set me free. And I don't know, I love this particular quote, and I don't know who said it, but if you stumble, make it part of the dance. Mm -hmm. I just absolutely love this. And so let me tell you a story about somebody who was in the middle of an epic stumble, but he made it part of his dance. So Niccolo Paganini was an Italian violinist, the most celebrated violin virtuoso of his time. And he left his mark as one of the pillars of the model, modern violin technique. And he came out on the stage one night for a concert hearing a huge round of applause. <clears throat> and he noticed that the violin in his hand was not his own special one-of-a-kind instrument, uniquely fashioned for him. Well, he was so embarrassed. So he told the crowd that there must have been some mistake and he didn't have his own violin. So he excused himself and he hurried behind the curtain to grab that special violin. And it was gone. Somebody had stolen that. And they left the secondhand one that he was holding. So he remained back of the curtain for a moment. Fail. Oh my gosh. But he came out <clears throat> to the audience and he explained his predicament. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I will show you that the music is not 
in the instrument, mm -hmm. but in the soul. And he played as he had never played before. And the music that poured forth from that old violin enraptured the audience. And when he was finished, the thrilled audience gave him a standing ovation. I would venture to say that if Niccolo hadn't told them that that wasn't his own special violin and that it was an epic fail in the making, that they would have known. They would, he took that stumble and he made it part of the dance. And the second P, the first one is, what's the first one? Selfless. Selfless, Selfless yay. And the second one is prepare. Know your stuff. Keep it simple. Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply enough, you don't know it well enough. And here's a little story about a little preschool boy who was sitting in the back seat of his car, of his daddy's car, and he said, Daddy, why is the apple turning brown? And the boy's father explained, I have to read this because there's big words in it. Because after you take the skin off, the body of the apple came in contact with the air, which caused it to oxidize, thus changing its molecular structure and turning it into a different color. And there was a long silence. And the little boy asked, Daddy, are you talking to me? So you have to make it simple. You have to talk with people and not above them. And you know what else preparing does? It gives you tremendous confidence. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you conviction. And when we as the speaker are convicted, the audience is convicted. And we want the audience to come away with simple concepts that they can apply. And when it's simple, that can happen. Oh, missed that one. Okay. And then there's energy. What were the first two? Yeah. And then there's energy. Connecting requires energy. So you have to have a passion about what you are speaking about. And again, this comes from conviction as also, I try not to speak about things that I have not experienced or that I don't know about a whole lot. Because if I'm not convinced, then you are not convinced. And another thing that gives me great energy is to be grateful for the audience and be grateful for the opportunity to speak. Because when you go in with an attitude of gratitude, it really increases your energy. So try and be grumpy and scared and grateful at the same time. <laughs> it does not happen. And this morning I read, once you feel gratitude for difficulty, which speaking can be for a lot of people, it loses its power. It loses its power to drag you down. So be grateful as well. And then another thing that gives you tremendous energy is putting a 10 right here on people's heads, viewing everyone as a 10, as a unique, valuable individual. So a mother wishing to encourage her son's progress at the piano, bought tickets to a performance by the great Polish pianist Ignacy Paderewski. When the evening arrived, they found their seats near the front of the concert hall, and the boy I, the majestic Steinway waiting on the stage. Soon the mother found a friend too, and the little boy slipped away. At eight o'clock, the lights in the auditorium began to dim and the spotlights came on. And only then did they notice the boy up on the piano bench, innocently picking out chopsticks. The crowd became frustrated with the little imp. His mother gasped in shock and she was so embarrassed but before she could retrieve her son, the master appeared on the stage and quickly moved to the keyboard. And he whispered gently to the boy, don't quit, keep playing. And leaning over, Paderewski reached down with his left hand and began filling in the bass part. And soon his right arm reached around the other side and, and improvised a delightful tune. Together, the old master and the young novice held the crowd mesmerized with their blended and beautiful music. When they were finished, they got a standing ovation. You know, Paderewski could have gotten all huffy about that little boy playing that gorgeous baby grand. 
but he made it a moment to remember by affirming that young man's novice talent. Paderewski made his entrance about helping the boy, not about him. So let me ask you a question. How do you feel after you help someone? Interactive, right? Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> exactly. You're doing that when you speak. You are helping people when you speak. You need to remember that. And another way to increase your energy is to smile. Your face is going to communicate anyway. And you might as well make it positive. 90% of what we convey has nothing to do with what we say. What we say is 7%. The way we say it is 30%. And what others see is 55%. I've heard this once, well, more than once, from my husband. Jan, it is not what you say. It's how you say it. And I used to react like this. What? Well, he wasn't amused. Which brings us to our next topic. <laughs> Stories and humor. You don't have to be a stand-up comic, but convey your message with levity. Use stories and illustrations because our brain remembers the stories best. And like Isaac, when you use your own personal stories, nobody can argue with them. And nobody can argue with how you're feeling in that story because it's yours. Your personal story, your connects your audience to you. And laughing dissipates the ego and helps your audience connect with you better. I have one more story for you. And this is about a gentleman who had a total fear of someone living under his bed at night. And he went to a shrink and told him, I've got problems. Every time I go to bed, I think there's somebody under it. I'm scared. I think I'm going crazy. Well, just put yourself in my hands for one year, said the shrink. Come talk to me three times a week, and we should be able to get rid of those fears. Well, how much do you charge, asked the gentleman. $150 per visit, replied the doctor. And the gentleman said, I'll sleep on it. I thought that was weird. <laughs> okay. So six months later, the doctor met him on the street. Why didn't you come to see me about those fears you were having, he asked. Well, the gentleman replied, $150 a visit, three times a week for a year is $23,400. A bartender cured me for 10. <laughs> I was so happy to have saved all that money that I went and I bought a new pickup truck. <laughs> is that so? With a bit of attitude, the shrink said. And how may I ask? Did the bartender cure you? He told me he got the legs off the bed. Ain't nobody under there now. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with connecting, but anyway, I thought that was a funny story. And last is courage. Yes, I understand. It doesn't isn't spelled like that, but that was the best I could do. So I first heard Isaac speak in 2017, and he was so, well, you've seen him speak, so motivational, so encouraging, so just uplifting and wild. I loved it. I wanted to learn how to speak like him. And I saw him speak at Tri-Cities and on my way back to Grandview where I lived at the time, I was like, oh man, I gotta just figure out just exactly how to speak like Isaac. And then I remembered the concept of authenticity. <laughs> Everybody has their own unique voice. Not everybody relates to Isaac. Not everybody is going to relate to me. I'm probably driving some of you nuts today. But keep this in mind. There are some people out there that are waiting to hear the message from you because you are the only one that they're going to get the message from. So you can't be afraid to speak. Somebody needs to hear your voice. And the best way to get over your fear of it, baby steps, absolutely baby steps. Do short presentations. Go in the bathroom, high five yourself because you did it. <laughs> and when you celebrate those, you're creating neural, neural pathways in the brain of success for speaking. Small baby steps 
manageable doses and build on those. Because once the brain learns that nothing horrible is going to happen at the mic, it stops signaling the body to flight. <clears throat> so after all of my years of speaking and still trying to improve, I came to the conclusion that it really wasn't about becoming the best speaker. It wasn't about becoming like another speaker. It's about becoming the person that people want to connect with. It's about becoming the best you. And so now I'm gonna bring Isaac in for the clothes. Can we get up a jam? Yeah, you might need that. Awesome, man. All right. Um, this is going to be the last aspect of this, and this is honestly the most important part of every presentation. And um, that is the close. Say the close. The close. The close. Awesome. So, so once you understand the value that Jan just brought, understanding that it is important for you to be very selfless. But why are you selfless? You're selfless because you believe that what you bring to the table is actually going to help the people that you're speaking to. You believe it. It's in your gut. It's in your soul. I remember when I used to work at Hapo, they had a thing. It was called E-Statements. And I saw, you know, they brought me in as a teller. I was like, I ain't applied to be a teller, but well, I'll come in where I can come in. <laughs> and they brought me in to be a teller. But then they told me there was something called E-Statements. I could get $5 of the e -statement. So in my mind, I was like, I, this job ain't too bad. I'm going to give myself a $5 raise. I'm going to give one e-statement every single hour. $5 raise. <laughs> I ended up pulling, I averaged about 120 and 143 e-statements a month. Gave myself a little great raise. They would have to audit me, and they was trying to see if I was cheating. I was <laughs> cheating. <laughs> but what it was, was is I believed in the product so much, and I framed it in such a way, when I presented it to the people, they didn't even know what they were getting. I mean, they was just eating out of my hand the whole time. They would sit in line. I went in for Isaac. I bet you eat. <laughs> yeah, they're coming to me. Why? Because I understood how to close them. I understood how to be selfless. And what it was I was presenting and give them an opportunity to improve their experience with the organization that I was working with at the time. And when you understand these things, it helps you close better. And what, what kills me is when people present, but they don't have a close. The close is the whole reason why you go in there. The close is the whole reason why you begin the presentation. Why? You want them to act on what it is that you presented to them. Correct? Mm -hmm. Or else you're just kind of wasting your time. When I go in and I speak at schools, I have a close. Why? Because I want the students to engage with what it is that I'm presenting. I want there to be action. When I go in and I present to organizations, I'm doing five weeks for Benton County here starting in January, five-week training. When I go in there, I'm wanting there to be action after I finish. There's going to be a close every <laughs> Isn't it? Why? Because I want there to be more action. I care about them, and I want to grow in our relationship. I believe in my product, and I believe that there's more that I can offer. When you don't put together a close, basically you're saying, hey, thank you so much. It's great. I hope this was good. We'll see you. It's like, help me, Lord. It's like <laughs> that old school I'm not going there. We're not going there. We're not going there. You're using them and dumping them. All right? Let's not do that. Let's actually add value into what we're doing. There has to be a close. And so listen, today we put together a close for you guys because we want you to have presentations that will help your audience and that will put you in a position to forge relationships with them and a connection with them that will drive them to action. It's the whole reason why we put this whole thing together. We believe, me and Jan both believe, that the information that you're getting today is going to not only put you in a better position to be able to present better, it's going to allow you to be comfortable and not only improve the organization you work for, but also improve your life and put you in a great position. So this is the close that we have. This is the ask. It's the most important part. I used to love putting the ask together in the presentations. 
they had to pull me back. You asked him for too much. No, I'm not. But it's his ass. Is <laughs> this is ass. And the ass today is a phenomenal ass. We got two tools for you, for you to grow. All right. We got a tool that's called Fruitful Leadership that Jan wrote. Amazing book that she wrote on how to lead by the fruits of the spirit. I love this. Listen, man, I was, look, y'all don't know my background, but listen, I know that you need the fruits in order to get to the level that you need to get to. And so this book will take you to the next level. I also have a product called Sound Smart um, that I'm going to give away for free. I created this product in 2019 because I had a lot of people coming to me and asking me, Isaac, how do I do this presenting thing? And they said, I see you speaking a lot, you're traveling everywhere, it looks cool. So I know it's a lot. My wife hates that I'm gone all the time. And I definitely don't got time to sit down with you too. And so I put together a program called Sound Smart. There's a way to sound smart, the acronym that you'll walk through on that. But what I've given you inside of this is the five secrets that I, I use in order to make $30,000 in three months. And when I found that out, I was like, okay, who's going to have to run that play? My wife said, yeah, run that play. <laughs> and, over, and over again. All right? And so there's five secrets that I have in there that'll help you. Now, listen, inside of that as well, if you want more after that, you can find me real simply at IsaacBuss.com. If you want more from Jan, you can find her real simply as well. There is a QR code on there that you can connect with us and grow with us. Why? Because we don't just want to present right now and just leave you guys. We actually want to add value to what you're doing and help you get to the next level. How does that sound? I have one more thing. Go ahead. Okay. I am putting on a complimentary webinar on January 5th, and it's going to be on preparing your own personal vision statement. So what this is going to do, it's going to help you step by step with becoming the best you, that person that people want to connect with. So if you would like information on that, just come up and see me afterwards. Absolutely amazing. And I am going to pass the question time. time. Oh, the question time. Awesome, man. Yep. Let's do questions. Let's Let's Here we go. If you're asked to present on a relatively dry subject, <laughs> like a certification exam preparation, and it's fully online, other than directly questioning the attendee, what's your favorite way to keep people interacting and learning? Go? Uh, no, because I don't do dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, it's going to be the research that you have done on the organization or the topic that you that you do. One of the things that I do when I present anywhere, I do what's called a discovery call. And that discovery call allows me to know the little innuendos that the company always says or a little chants. And, and so what happens is, is I, I'm able to connect with the organization and my presentation isn't as dry. Honestly, I don't know if I really do dry presentations, but it wouldn't be as dry as it normally would. Honestly, really, this is the key to create yeah. a presentation that's not dry. You must do your research on the organization. It's the same thing that I would do when I would interview anywhere when I was trying to get a job. I would go in there and I would start, I interviewed at PNL. No, they didn't hire me, but they did hire me to speak a couple of years back. They did hire me. They did. I let them know that too when they brought me in. <laughs> y'all didn't hire me, but y'all hired me today though. <laughs> Um, but I did my research on the organization. So when I went in there, I'm telling them, like, it's amazing what you guys did with the outside of the Skittle. Y'all made the Skittle outside. And I was like, that's just amazing. The person interviewing me was like, huh? And they're like, yo, check the facts on this. Came back. I was like, yeah, we did do that. I'm like, I know. I did the research. And I know exactly what it is that you do. Yeah, you know, the Xerox machine, too. You know it. And they were like, oh, man, you did. Yeah, I did my research to make a conversation that could have been dry, not dry, why? Because I was just trying to find opportunities to forge connections with them. And when you do that, when you start talking about how great other people are, what they do, how amazing their organization is and where they're trying to get to, what was once dry all of a sudden connects them to the future that they are wanting behind their product or the pitch or the offer that we're using them. 
And that's true because that does come down to the discovery meeting because when I'm in a discovery meeting with an organization, I always ask them what they want. What do you want this presentation to look like at the end? What do you want the great outcome to be? And so when they'll give me a couple of steps and then I'll go back and I'll find a way to make it more fun. Yeah, thank you. The questions. I have a question. When it comes to tempo, how do you maintain your tempo if there's questions in between, like during your presentation? Yeah. Or would you suggest always withholding questions until the end so you can keep your tempo? Yeah, great question. No, I do a whole lot more training and teaching than I do just presentations or keynotes. And so it's um, keep the tempo until they ask a question. It's kind of like pressing the pause button when you're listening to your really fun music, mm -hmm. you know, and then you, and then you keep the music going and then you press the pause button while you answer the question. Make sure you get the question answered for them and then continue listening to your good music. Yeah, I think the powerful thing about I love doing workshops sometimes more than keynotes. And the reason being is, for example, when Jan was telling stories or when I was telling stories, it took you to a place that you were connecting with it. You were thinking about your own personal thing, how this relates to me. Like you were thinking those things. Well, the reason why I like workshops is because now we're going to take a moment and everybody's going to immerse in that train of thought. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to ask your questions. You're going to be writing down. Sometimes I take out these big butcher boards and everybody's sitting at tables and everybody is writing down what they think around that. Then everybody speaks about it. Then we bring that thing back and wrap it with a bow and we end that point. But now, not only has everybody been able to think around what it was that was being presented and the thought process behind what was being presented, but they were also able to connect with it in a very malleable way that allows there to be a different level of an impact and effect on them. So I love it. when, And also, it depends on the presentation, right? So like, if I'm doing a keynote, I'm not... Unless there's just, you know, spirit like, hey, man, we going this route. But typically, I'm just flat out doing my presentation. And then we'll have Ken uh, Q&A if we're doing like a workshop or a breakout um, later. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Great question. What personal care or wellness recommendations do you have to prep yourself for a pre presentation? In a sense, how do you cultivate your own energy? <laughs> <laughs> you really want to know? <laughs> Red, of course. You, you really want to know? Hey, Mac, I'm only keeping one thousand, man. So, um, man, I, I'm I'm just a man. I'm a man of faith. I'm a strong man of faith, man. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to front. I'm not going to cut through the chase with y'all. And so, for me, man, the way that I stay prepared is I just stay read right up and studied up, man. I just know that all things work together for the good that are called, for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. And I know that my purpose on this earth is to do what I do. And so as long as I'm moving in this space and in this vein, I know every time I pick up a mic, every time that I speak into someone's life, something's going to shift. I know something's going to change. I know that when they leave, they're going to be thinking completely different than when they walked in. I know if there was hopelessness, I know there's going to be hope. I just know these things. And so for me, that's how I get prepared. And I feel like everybody's going to have to figure that out. I also spend at least 20 to 30 minutes every morning on my Peloton. Okay. <laughs> and so that that's how I get prepared, though. I make sure that I am in a place where um, spiritually I can connect because speaking is such a spiritual thing, man. Like things literally shift in my mind. Like I know that things shift. I know that people connect and they can feel it. They can just feel it. And so I know that, man, if I'm going to honor this craft, I got to make sure to keep my energy right and I'm plugged in with what I know is the truth. So that, that's how I do it. And so for me, um, yeah, the weightlifting and the exercise really helps with that. Um, when I know what an organization wants, I do all the research, get all the information that I could possibly get. And um, remember how I talked about content at the very beginning, it's not that important. I used to put so much content into stuff that I was an information spitter outer. <laughs> and then I had to realize, wait, 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 you're, you're not, because I'm a D, disc style, you know, result, get it done, and you're out of here. But I had to change. I had to, you know, learn how to connect. So I'd get very, very prepared and then um, get it down in a manner that I 
felt they would receive it in. That would be the easiest for them to learn the concepts and then apply them. Because one event, one workshop, that's not going to get it. You got, you have to have them learn to apply them. And then before I speak, I'm normally a little anxious. And so um, worship, worship dispels the fear every stink of time or Tower of Power. They do that as well. And if you're really young and you don't know Tower of Power, it's like Motown. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dance in my office and then I'm ready. Well, Motown cleans everything up. <laughs> <laughs> what tips do you have for giving presentations as a nonprofit, asking for donations, especially in the current climate? Oh, this is my wheelhouse. It's a nonprofit asking. I love to ask for money. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I, and, and I did it well. I did it well. Um, yeah, I ran a nonprofit for about 14 years, and we ended up doing really well. If, I have a whole thing on fundraising. Um, that would be my tip. <laughs> Uh, my big tip is there's a ton of money out there. And so what I had to do is I had to change the way I thought about that, about, oh, God, ask them if they're going to tell me no. No, they weren't telling me no. They were telling my organization no. And I was all right with that. And since my organization was faith-based, they weren't telling me no. They were telling God no. I was <laughs> totally fine with that. But since... God might have put something else on their part, somewhere else for them to give. But I just knew that if I asked enough, people would come in and people would give. 100%. Hey, can you re-ask the question real quick? I want to make sure I ask. That's all right. Um, it was something about any tips on how to ask for money. How to ask for money yeah. for nonprofit. Is that what it was? In yeah. this culture. Okay. Yeah, our current climate. Yeah. Um for the presentation itself. For the presentation yeah. itself. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, I think that inside of the presentation, um, the value add is is the most important aspect. I think a lot of people forget to add value in what you're what you're offering. And so if you can't properly add value, um, then the ask the, the ask is never going to happen. For us, with our nonprofit, uh, Wake Up Nation Foundation, so we, we send kids all over the world. We just sent a girl to Papua New Guinea. She played in a national or uh, international basketball um, tournament. I mean, she's phenomenal. She's got a lot of Division One offers. She's going to be amazing. Her family couldn't afford to send her to Papua New Guinea. She applied with us. And so for us, when we do our presentations, I mean, we have the pictures of the kids with the checks when we're in the schools and they got the $500 check there and then they see them overseas. We sent a girl to, she wanted to be in the circus. So we sent her to Texas to a circus camp. I mean, these were the things that they said, this is gonna help me be the best person I can be. And so when you're able to create that value, then when you ask, it's so simple because everybody wants to share, Jan asked the question at the beginning, who in here loves service? And what is that thing that you get, that feeling you get when you serve? Everybody wants that. And so if you can frame your presentation to scratch that itch mm -hmm. in a way that they're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I want. I want to help kids. I want kids to have a better future than I ever had. I want them to be able to exceed where I was. I want it to be easier. Awesome. Then give me your money. You know? <laughs> and so so it's it's simple like that so if you can frame it that way the ask is easy and in the midst of your presentation tell stories of your impact yeah stories of the people that you have impacted as a nonprofit, and then when you tell them this is what we are going to do with your money you come back about six months later and you show them you've done that with your money everybody wants to have an impact, but they also want to be on a winning team. Oh. They want to belong to a winning team. Oh. Okay, what happens when you get someone distracting in your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I learned this the hard way. So when I first started speaking in schools, man. <laughs> so there was a kid that was um, in the presentation uh, and man, it was a kid. I knew his mama, you know, I knew I knew his grandma, you know, and so he was up there. He had his phone out. He was distracting the other kid. Man, I'm going in, you know, I'm I'm in my vein. And I'm like, man, these kids, the teachers told me, principal brought me in. She said, these kids need this. And I'm thinking, I know your grandma told me what you're going through, you know? And so I'm in my flow and I just stopped and I was like, hey, man, I know you. I, in the middle of my presentation, <laughs> everybody turned, looked at him. Teacher came over. They was embarrassed, took the phone away from him. Um. I was able to smoothly bring it back in. But I sat back um, after that and I was like, I'll never do that again uh, because it distracted, it became more of a distraction because he was only distracting the four or five people around him, but there was an audience of 500 there. Mm -hmm. And so to me, when you have somebody that's distracting, let them be a distraction. Yeah. You still focus on your mission because when you focus on the distraction, you, you forget the most important, in my opinion, part, which is S and speak, which is being selfless. Because the only reason why you're focused on that is because your little ego is rising up. You know what I'm saying? And you, you like, how dare they, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not listen to this information that I have. And, and so then you can go ahead and dive down that lane if you want to. But the people are going to remember that distraction more than they remember the information that you have. And so the way I deal with distractions is I just let them do their thing because I know that there's a handful of not everybody in here that's going to change from what it is that I'm saying. And guess what? They just missed out, baby. That's how I look at it. Man, that's so sad because I know what I'm saying will change your life. And so if you got the distraction, let them distract. Yeah, agreed. On that note, to follow up with that, how do you, I guess, create the buy-in when you are speaking on what could be considered controversial topics? Yeah. Um, like, especially at work, surrounding a lot of like DEI topics and with racism, and and it's a, just already a lot of emotions. Yeah either way surrounding those topics how do you for one manage yourself in those situations and then two how do you help manage the tone in the room if possible when you know you're delivering something that might be stepping on somebody's toes or someone may not be ready to receive what you're going to say but they are required to uh by their organization and like how do you create the buy-in or is it just another situation where you're just I'm going to give it and whoever gets it it's for them to get it or are you trying to include what could be the naysayers of the people in opposition to what you're bringing? You know I've not ever been in that position before but um, if I were in that position what I would do is I would speak about it up front I would talk about, you know, I'm, I might be stepping on some people's toes um, and you may not want to hear all this, but um, this is something that I am being paid to come in and do. I'm not doing this in a judgmental manner at all. Um, just I would just speak about it up front, set the tone. And... If I do step on somebody's toes and I can see it in the audience, um, if I have an opportunity, I'll go make that better. It, it'll be my fault. I'll just go make it my fault and try and make that better. You know, 2019, PNL actually hired me to do diversity and inclusion in the middle of the Trump campaign. Uh, it was Trump just got hired. <laughs> Hi. You know what I mean. And so <laughs> I'm sitting here like, man, thank God for the opportunity, but y'all know who y'all hired. And so really 
it was a really tough season just for the country, for everybody. You know what I mean? It was just a different thing. And and really what I did was is I turned the whole presentation on its head because I believe that a lot of people thought I was going to come in there and I was going to present in a way that was like, y'all need to get it together. You need to do. But I, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I tell stories. And so as I went through and looked at what they wanted to cover, I found stories that I was the offender on. That's what I did. And so now it just, it flipped everything on its head. It flipped everything on its head. I, I told a story about when I was working at Happo and, and, and I was I was at the West Pasco branch and and I could I started my boy Boomer taught me how to speak some Spanish. I could speak a little Spanish. The father throwing that check it the orals, you know. <laughs> I, I could speak a little Spanish. And so I was feeling myself. The people would come up and they'd be like, oh my gosh, like, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, oh, that's been your un poquito. You know, I you know, I do my thing. And 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 what ended up happening, I started feeling myself a little bit. And there would be always the day, it was like Friday, the migrant workers would come in. And so they would come in and they came in and and I was like, ah, I can help you here. And they came up and I was confident. The father on the check us all and the dude flipped it on me. He said, Oh, I see what this is. You think because I'm Mexican, I can speak Spanish. I was like, oh whoa. He was like, y'all racist in here. I came in here because y'all deposited the check in the wrong account. Like he was already hot. Oh, wow. But I jumped to conclusions. And so I, I flipped the whole thing on his head. And I was like, who's ever done that before? Mm -hmm. Because I've done it. And so now it wasn't this like offensive thing mm -hmm. where everybody was like, oh my gosh, like this, this black guy is going to come in here. No, it was like, oh, I've done it too. But I'm not above this because everybody's done it. Like, forget it, we're all humans. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we all have done it. And so what I did was I came up with examples. I came up with an example from when I was in college and I had. A, a, a teacher, he he's, he was from uh, Korea. He couldn't speak great English. It was choppy. And so I I got out of his class thinking I'm not going, I can't understand. You say that too, it's negative. He said that too, to say negative. I'm like, this ain't going to work for me. He was the best teacher. I got boys that they, y'all half retarded passing his class. And I joined a class with somebody I she was no worse. She was straight from hell. I'm sorry. That's what we were doing. I couldn't pass. And I was like, why did I drop that class? Why did I drop that class? Because I had this idea that this is how he's going to function. And so I put, I, you know what I'm saying? And so what I do in those situations is I try to put myself in the place as the, as, as the offender because I'm a trusted voice when you hire me. And so now I'm a trusted voice. I can connect with you in a way that's like, look, I've been there too. And what was so beautiful about that whole session is that everybody was speaking. Everybody. It didn't matter if he was white, black, Hispanic, everybody. Like, so what do we do in these situations? And like that, like every and everybody left in power. And so, like, yeah, I've been there before where you're like, man, this is gonna be hard. Yeah, it will be hard, but if you make it personal, then people will connect with the story, with your story. And if you're trying to act like you above the law, then that's when you got people over here shutting down and bit nah. Everybody, I don't care if you're black, white, polka dot, Chinese, I don't care what you is. We've all had those moments. And so what I did was, is I was like, yo, how can I take a hard conversation and bring some levity, some humor? How can I, how can I do that here? Um, but not the joke be on you, but it to be on me. How can I make it so that the egg's on my face and not on your face so that you'll connect with what it is that I'm trying to bring? Um, so that that's that's how I handled that particular situation. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever heard God will get you for that? What's up? Have you ever heard God will get you for that? No, you I dropped haven't. out of one class and went right into one. You, <laughs> <I'm telling> you, <laughs> you ain't lying, man. I got hooked up. My I played football in college, and she told me she's like, "This is the best guy." So I was like, "Okay." I'm getting to the class, you know, the athletic uh, academic advisor. She hooked me up. I get in there, and then I dropped it in the first week. And I'm over here like, oh, my gosh, I was complaining. I remember walking through the campus and I'm looking at the boy, my boys that were still in it. And I'm like, oh, how's that class going? And they were like, he's the best ever. He took <laughs> so much time. He sends stuff home for you. We can go into his office whenever we want. I'm thinking, how's your class? I'm like, 
<laughs> but thank you for asking that question. Sorry to point. Yeah. yeah, really good. If you feel that your presentation is falling apart, how do you go to plan B? <laughs> Hmm. Um, I'm not supposed to do arm, am I? You just had to be. <laughs> I've had some horrible moments. I've had some horrible moments. I'll go to school assembly. I tried to come out hyping the kids up. This was early on in my speaking career. It's the wrong thing to do. Okay? The kids aren't trying to be hyped up. Like they're, they just aren't. They want to connect with something real. I went down the deal, I'm throwing shirts out, like, yeah, you know, and I'm backing up, about to land into my presentation. I hit the whole projector screen, like the whole screen. <laughs> hit the whole thing, the whole thing was off. And I'm like, oh, let me get back. And then it was like, look, just present. You know what I mean? Like, you're here, you're here now. I know you look like a fool and probably ain't nobody going to listen to you. But the reality is, is that I was prepared. And so even though there was a moment that there was a lapse, because I was prepared, I just I just went with the presentation. Like, that's what I did. And after that, I had kids coming up. They was crying. And I was like, OK, they forgot about the, <laughs> the whole situation that took place. Um, and so, you know, in those moments, you either going to sink or swim, but I think that you just got to stay on mission and know, like, for real, this is my purpose and I'm, I'm here to help this organization. I'm here to help the students, the staff. That's what I'm here for. So even when it's going a little bit weird, you know, just stay on mission. Yeah, exactly. That, that happened. I could tell one of the people in this, one of the individuals in this group that I was training. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you do with that? Um, and the others were fine, but she was definitely not buying anything. Yeah, and so I tried to talk to her afterwards, and she wanted there was nothing I could do. But I went on and continued to speak, and impacted the ones who wanted to be impacted. You know, sometimes when you tell somebody the truth, <laughs> they don't want to hear it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that you just speak. Yeah, it, man. yeah, just speak. yeah. Just speak. Yeah. Sometimes I'll turn it into an interactive thing too. Like I've dropped my notes on the ground, and then it's like it's gonna be really awkward. So you turn to your neighbor and yeah, you give them a, a task, right? And then they just love to talk to each other. Oh well, meanwhile I'm getting my PowerPoint booted back up or whatever. So oftentimes if you throw it back to the audience. To connect, you've got time to regroup. Yeah, yeah. I'll also say this, man. You make sure that you leave room in your presentation to flow. Mm -hmm. So after COVID, I got hired and I spoke at a school in San Diego. They brought me in to like start their, their deal off. They said they were a big school, but I did not realize how big of a school they were. And so I went in there and I'm thinking I'm doing like two presentations and they were like, oh, we got to do four assemblies. You got to go through workshops with four. And every single group was like 500 kids. And I'm like, this is not what I thought I was signing up for, but y'all paid me really well. So. <laughs> and so I got in there and you were dealing with COVID mindsets. And li listen, if y'all can speak to kids, you can speak to anybody. Yeah. And this is what happened. I was like, okay, man, my presentation is dope. But man, these kids need something different. Like they don't need me just to do my presentation. They need me to go deep. And so as I was presenting, I could see kids. And this is the other thing. I walked in and they had all the kids at round tables, right? So I'm thinking it's going to be like stadium seating. They had them all at round tables because that was the only way they could do it. Their gymnasium wasn't big enough. And so I'm like, okay. So what I ended up doing was I left room in the presentation for flow. So I would see kids and I would see the ones that were connecting with whatever point I was on. And I would go over there and I would just start speaking into their lives around the point. And I'm telling you, it was the most impactful. Wasn't in my notes, but I left room for flow yeah. just in case things weren't going the way that I needed them to go. 
And real talk, they weren't because you were just like, oh my God. Like they laughed at that joke, but that joke always hits and they were just, <laughs> okay, we're going to have to switch this up. But if as a presenter, you understand that and you, you allow yourself to do that and just practice it. I'll tell you how I practice. I learned this from Inky Johnson. He's one of my coaches. I don't know if you guys know who Inky Johnson is. Great dude. And so he's one of my coaches. I hired them um, earlier this year. Him, Eric Thomas, and my man Jeremy Anderson are my coaches. And I do, I do, I have conversations with them every single week on Zoom. And one of the things Inky Johnson told me, um, he said, "Hey, look, what you should do is you should practice on um, on on uh, the spare of the moment moments inside your presentation." So I said, "How do you do that?" He said, "Look." When you're driving down the road, you see a, a Motel 6, create a presentation like you're speaking to Motel 6 on the spot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this. I'm driving down. I see McDonald's. I'm just training that muscle. I'm like talking to McDon like McDonald's, you know, like you guys are the golden arches and I know everything. That, yeah, I'm just the whole thing. And I'm going down the whole thing and I'm coming down with points like. You know, if you're going to make people smile, then I'm coming up with an acronym on, you know, you got to be selfless. You got to make sure that you're coming in with the mindset for the people. You got to make sure that you have integrity behind what you're doing. You got to make sure that everybody comes in. If they were sad, they leave and they're laughing. And you got to make sure to do it with excellence. You know, like I'm literally just going through and just making up stuff on the spot to perfect my craft just in case there's moments where I got to. I got to pivot, you know what I mean? And so if you're not prepared, when it comes time to pivot, you're going to look like a fool. So make sure that you're doing those things inside of your presentation. That's, that's what I would do. And one thing that really helped me as well, when I first started out in my own business in 2018, 2018, 2019, I started doing Facebook Lives. Mm -hmm. And I just would do them just two-minute baby steps, just two-minute Facebook Lives because nobody cares if you make a mistake on a Facebook Live. And you can look dorky. I mean, if you go to my my uh, Facebook page, you'll see some of my old lives. Oh, my gosh, they were so bad. But I got the practice. I got the practice in of on the spot, pivoting. And, oh, this would be a good thing to talk about. And then you get out there and you, you know, have like a minute and 30 seconds because you don't have any, you know. But they got better. So you can practice that way as well. Last question, a lightning round question here. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, the message or the customer? Customer. Customer? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Yeah. I, I would say, just for me and my path, man, the message was birthed inside of me, and the customers just, they come after that. And I believe that as a presenter, once you can birth that message inside of you um, and you really believe in it, that I just firmly believe, man, God's going to put everybody in front of you that needs to hear that message, man. That's what I did. All right, let's thank our experts today. Yeah, if you want to stick around with them, I think there's information on the handout too. Yeah, your contact information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus the, the slide that we saw earlier uh, on that. And again, this will be placed on YouTube and you'll get a copy of the slides as well. For signing up and registering. We also want to again thank STCU for sponsoring at the expert. Thank you. Thank you. Three to participate. Uh, quick drawing. So Jan yes. is donating of a free coaching session. Free coaching session. Oh, there's nothing in there. Oh. 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 I have a card for you. Well, we'll throw a card in there. No, you were asked. Quick. Good odds to win. <laughs> Good odds to win. Whenever you come in, throw it in there. And um, as we do that, so Isaac's, uh, Isaac's gift is to everybody. And that was. The slide before this. Yeah. Isaac, say it one more time. It's the Sound Smart. Yeah, it's called Sound Smart. Sound Smart's an acronym. And if you reach out to me, I'll give you the full thing. Honestly, yeah. the full entire curriculum is too big to upload yeah. on this thing. Um, but you will get that five secrets that I have right there in that. So you'll be able to get that. Um, yeah. I should have put the audio book on there too. There's an audio book that reads the whole thing to you. I'll have my tech team put the audio book on there um, so that you guys can listen to the audio too.
Um, all right. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thanks. Michelle Holt, you are the winner of Dan McDonald's. Yeah. Three. Okay. Uh, afterwards. Yep. And would you please do us a favor and fill out the survey? You can just leave it, flip it over on your table on the way out. If you are on Zoom, go ahead and uh, scan that QR code and uh, send that over. Our next Ask the Experts, it's always the fourth Tuesday of the month, except for this month, uh, from 3 to 4.30, January 23, mark your calendars. It's going to be about AI, running an AI and enhanced business. It's down to earth AI. So we got three experts on this that are going to try to bring it down to our level, especially if we've never played with it before, uh, and hope you'll join us again. So may you have a fantastic holiday, and we'll see you in 2024. Thanks again.